Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Run a High-Margin Solventless Extraction Lab. My name is Tony Lang, and I'm the Associate Editor of Cannabis Business Times. In today's webinar, Cliff Haney, the Director of Marketing at Denver-based Low Temp Industries, will discuss the critical components of a high-margin solventless lab in today's market. With the ever-increasing popularity of live rosin, rosin cartridges, and a variety of other sought-after solventless SKUs, the need to make them as profitable as possible is critical for operators. In addition to getting into some of the most important considerations for solventless lab teams, this webinar will provide cannabis growers with key insights for genetic sourcing and cultivation techniques for maximum yield with solventless. But before we get started with this insights-filled presentation, I just wanna make a few quick housekeeping notes. First, you're gonna see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. If you click on that, that will open the Q&A box. So please feel free to type in your questions as we move through the presentation and we will get to as many as possible at the end of this event. Second, just know that we are recording today's webinar and we're gonna send a copy of the video to all registrants via emails in the coming days. So please keep a lookout for that. With that, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Cliff Haney at Low Temp Industries. Cliff is a longtime solventless processing professional who is here to help you learn how to get the most out of solventless extraction. Whether you're looking to get into solventless processing for the first time, or you're seeking information on how to make your existing lab more efficient, please don't shy away from asking the important questions. This is your opportunity. With that, I'm gonna pass the mic off to Cliff. Hey, Cliff, welcome. It's all yours. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Tony. And thanks to everyone who registered today. You know, solventless extracts have really taken the market by storm over the past few years. As consumers become more educated, this segment of the market will continue to grow. Today, we'll be discussing in detail how to run a high margin solventless extraction lab. The information I'm sharing today was compiled over years of working with companies in this space. Many of them succeeded, many of them failed. I noticed that the majority of the companies that succeeded focused on building an actual brand centered around quality products. Solventless SKUs are the best, lowest investment path to creating a premium brand. The companies I work with that try to compete with low price point, low quality, and low margin products such as Distillate really had a tough time staying alive as their markets matured. And once federal legalization hits, it will be even more difficult for those companies to compete with corporate cannabis. Here's a brief overview of the topics we will touch on today. The solventless extraction process workflow. For those of you unfamiliar, I'm gonna show you how to make these products. Why you need to plan to make solventless SKUs based on some data surrounding their increasing popularity. Which solventless products have the highest and the lowest margins for most processors. How to get the most out of your harvest. What to look for in genetics and cultivation to acquire material that will perform well with solventless extraction. You know, not all genetics are going to perform well for this extraction method. So that's a critical step. And common mistakes new operators make with solventless and how to avoid them. And some professional advice for operators on how to run a high margin solventless business. My name is Cliff Haney, and I'm currently the marketing director of Low Temp Industries, where we provide solventless extraction solutions to companies all over the world. I'm also the co-founder of Terp Guide, a website where we review cannabis products. I currently live in Denver, Colorado, where I've been working in the solventless extraction equipment space for the past five plus years. I've had the opportunity to help set up some of the largest solventless extraction companies in the world. Outside of the unit, United States, I've worked on projects in Spain, Switzerland, Thailand, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Mexico. Many of these markets are still medicinal or in the research phases, but it's really been, been a blessing to be able to see these markets grow and, and see solventless expand outside of the U.S. So for those unfamiliar with solventless extraction as a whole, here's a brief overview of the process. 
you know, solventless extraction is different than other extraction methods because it's purely mechanical. The goal here is to separate the trichome head from the stock and collect it. Other methods use hydrocarbons or solvents to completely dissolve the medicinal compounds found in those trichomes, where they then go back and refine this, remove the solvents and hydrocarbons from that product. You know, there are other methods of solventless extraction, but today we're going to focus exclusively on ice water hash and rosin production because those are the most popular in the market. In this process, only ice, water, heat, and pressure are used to capture desirable compounds found in the trichome heads on the surface of the plant. It all starts right here by adding flour, water, and ice to your agitation vessel. Fresh flow, frozen flour will typically yield the best results and fetch the highest price point at the dispensary level because it can be labeled as a live product. The flour is gently agitated in the vessel until all of the trichome heads are separated, where they are then collected in a series of filtration bags, often referred to as bubble bags. The hash collected from the bags is then scooped onto freeze dryer trays, where it will be frozen and then taken through the sublimation or drying process. It goes into the freeze dryer looking like a wet, clumpy sand. Uh, once it's dry, it will break up rather easily, looking like a dry, granular sand consistency. At this point in the process, you can sell your bubble hash as is, or you can turn it into several other SKUs. Some of those SKUs include full melt, piatella, temple balls, edibles, topicals, and even tinctures. Most operators now, though, are focusing on turning their bubble hash into rosin, Rosin gives them the ability to capture higher price points for the lesser quality micron ranges from their wash. The bubble hash is typically loaded into a 25 micron bag uh, that is covered by a sheet of parchment paper. Uh, the rosin press shown in the top right hand corner then applies heat and pressure to the product to release the medicinal compounds from the heads themselves, further refining your end product. As you can see, there are a lot more SKUs that are possible by taking your harvest all the way to rosin. Offering a large number of SKUs can help you reach a wider audience by casting a wider net. Some of these SKUs include shatter, cold cure, diamonds, sauce, butter, cartridges, edibles, beverages, topicals, tinctures. There are a ton of different products you can make. And later on in this presentation, we'll talk about the top three that you should focus on. Now that we're all familiar with the process, let's take a look at some of the current data surrounding solventless extracts that we compiled from BDSA analytics. Solventless rosin cartridges have grown by 400% from January 2022 to January 2023. Dabbable hash rosin sales have doubled between 2021 to 2023. And total basket sizes also increased in California and Colorado when solventless rosin or cartridges are purchased by 22 to 46 percent. As a dispensary owner, this means that your customers are purchasing solventless products. They're spending more money and to the tune of 22 to 46 percent more than they would if they weren't purchasing a solventless product. Keep this in mind as you educate your bud tenders and select what products to display at the counter. Here are the top three products you should focus on producing as a new operator. You know, I see so many new companies getting into the space, only focusing on dabbable concentrates when they're looking at solventless. Uh, but in new markets, dabbable concentrate sales are typically very low. And in order to thrive as a business, it's important to have products that appeal to consumers that can be intimid intimidated by the idea of dabbing. Uh, cold cure rosin is one of the most popular rosin consistency, but typically has the lowest margins of the other two products listed and requires the highest quality input. Rosin cartridges are popular for those on the go and generally fetch a slightly higher margin than cold cure rosin. It doesn't necessarily require your highest quality input as cold cure rosin does, and most companies sell them in half gram sizes. Finally, edibles are a no-brainer for any solventless processor. 
they capture the highest margins and can utilize any grade of quality from your harvest. While other SKUs like Full Melt are regarded as the pinnacle of quality for concentrates, they seem to only make sense in more mature markets such as California, Colorado, because there's a much larger connoisseur audience there. Consumers in new states, they need education and experience to understand why they would want to pay $50 to $60 for a gram instead of sticking with the cheap ounces of shake that they can purchase from any dispensary on any given week. Here's a little deeper dive on what cold cure rosin actually is. Uh, once your hash is collected and pressed into rosin, uh, it's sealed in a jar at room temperature for three to seven days. The goal is to naturally separate the terpenes from your products and then homogenize them into the mixture to create a soft, wet, and shelf-stable consistency. Some people do this curing in the refrigerator. It does require much longer cure times, but that is also a possibility that we've seen a lot of people starting to do here recently. This happens to be my personal favorite because of the jar appeal and the shelf stability. You know, I can leave a jar out for weeks upon time without noticing a significant decrease in quality that would be very apparent in other textures such as fresh press or a full melt hash. You'll really start to notice the clarity, the color, the smell, the taste start to degrade within hours even for some textures. Vape cartridges are pretty easy to make. Uh, the only other piece of equipment required is an oven. The hardest part of creating a cartridge is deciding which hardware to use for the cartridge or the battery. Uh, vapes are great for new markets or consumers because they're approachable, discreet, portable, and fairly convenient. Getting your rosin ready for edibles is as easy as decarboxylating it in an oven, similar to the cartridge making process. The difficult part of the process for edibles is selecting the right type of edible skew to make, and then having a formula that really stands out from other products on the market. Companies like Dialed In here in Colorado have taken away millions in market share from some of the biggest edible players by focusing on rosin edibles exclusively. Solventless is the best way to stand out in a sea of distillate edibles found in every cannabis market in the world. Now, I know a lot of these slides might seem unrelated to the topic of running a high margin lab. You know, we're not talking about labor, some of these other components, but you know, steps like harvesting your flower can really make or break the quality and the yields that you receive from your harvest. So here's just a few tips. Uh, first tip is to handle the flower by the stem or branch to avoid direct contact with the trichomes. As you can see, this picture is a good example of what not to do here. Now, sometimes it's unavoidable, uh, but you wanna try your best to never make direct contact with the buds themselves. You wanna freeze your flower within 30 minutes of harvesting or as soon as possible. Uh, this is gonna help you retain as many terpenes as possible in your end product. You wanna monitor these trichome heads with a scope or a jeweler's loop to ensure that they're at the peak. You wanna freeze your flower before sealing your bag or your container. When I say seal, I don't mean to vacuum seal. This is something that you want to avoid at all costs. Vacuum sealing can rupture trichome heads or form a solid brick of material once it's actually frozen. And, and once that is frozen into a solid brick, it's really hard to break that material up without doing some handling or letting it all fall out in the wash. And this just increases the amount of time it takes to get that material processing. You wanna defoliate your, your harvest uh, prior to harvest, this will minimize your time trimming and will give the plant a chance to heal to minimize chlorophyll leaching. So you want to go in there, pull off all those fan leaves, doing it a week before you harvest allows the point where you broke those, those leaves off to actually heal because every open spot that you have on that plant 
is just going to increase the chlorophyll that leaches out once it touches that water. You don't want to harvest early for color. I saw this a lot in the infancy stages of the solventless market. People were really focused on trying to create a light colored, a white colored product. You want to take your plants to full maturity just as you would if you were going to harvest for flower. This is really going to help you maximize your terpene and cannabinoid content in your end product. Uh, I don't recommend machine trimming, you know, unless you're harvesting acres upon acres instead of just room, uh, rooms indoor. There's a much higher possibility for chlorophyll contamination and damaging those trichome heads if you're using things like machine trimmers, bucking machines. But, you know, you reach a scale where you simply can't get around those things. So it's not the end of the world if you have to, but if you're really focused on quality, that will help you. Next, we'll discuss genetics and optimal material. You know, not all material is gonna perform well for solventless. There are some strains out there that no matter how well you grow them, they're just not gonna produce the yields for it to make sense for your business to take that flower and turn it into a concentrate. There are many strains and cultivars that are best as just selling as flour or maybe taking it to another form of extraction, such as solvent-based or hydrocarbon. Um, all of the, the yield ranges that I have list here are based on fresh frozen flour as your input. You know, the yields might seem fairly low because fresh frozen is anywhere from four to five times the weight of your dry flour. It still has all of the moisture from the growing process, and that is why there is a significant increase in that weight. So if you were to dry that material, uh, that weight would decrease by four to five times. One to 2% would be considered a low yield. Uh, you know, this type of yield can be less than break even, depending on your overhead, but it can still make sense for limited release batches if the terps are highly desirable. You really can't put a price on being known for that one batch that people talk about for years to come. Some strains are just special, and putting that out can really help you establish yourself as a premium brand. Three to four percent is the ideal base yield range to profit from. If you're hitting these numbers consistently, you'll be in good shape, and this is what most processors are seeking. Five to six plus percent is a very high yield range, obviously creating the highest profit potential as a business. Uh, this is rare to see them go above six percent, but I have seen strains that have yielded upwards to nine percent from fresh frozen to bubble hash. It's important to note, though, that high yields really aren't everything. Uh, consumers care about the terps, not your yields. Connoisseurs like good flavor profiles and new ones. So you can't rely on the same old strains to work for years and years to come and solventless. I have seen some strains stand the test of time. Things like papaya uh, are always popular on the market and typically some of the first rosin that leaves the shelves. But then you take other strains like GMO, for example. You know, when GMO first came out, it was highly sought after. It was perfect for processors because it was a very high yielder, but then the market got completely flooded with GMO for this reason, and we really started to see a decrease in popularity, and it's one of those strains that you don't see as much of anymore. Genetics and optimal material. Um, these are some of the top solventless genetic providers. There's Bloom Seed Co., there's Farmhouse Studio Genetics, Archive Seed Bank, Masonic Seed Co., Thug Pug. There are dozens of other providers out there that sell both clones and seeds that are going to work well for solventless extraction. But we've seen that a lot of our customers um, have really taken a liking to these companies because many of them focus on solventless genetics exclusively. This is a nice trichome shot from Farmhouse Studio Genetics or Schwale on Instagram. I love that they put out this kind of content where they show the cultivar at a macro level and even measure the size of the trichomes themselves 
so you can have a good idea of what it is you're going to be getting if you grow this strain under optimal conditions. There's a lot of different popular phenotypes out there that people seek out and that do well for solventless extraction. Uh, papaya strains, as I mentioned, are some of the first to go off of shelves, but there's also pie strains, cake strains, GMO variants, Skittle strains. The list goes on and on, and this list is going to continue to grow as more of these genetic providers step in and start to focus on hash genetics specifically. Here's some of the common mistakes new operators make and how to avoid them. So only focusing on yields, not the terps. As I mentioned, consumers could care less about the yields, your profit margins. They are seeking out the terps, the color, the texture, the consistency, the shelf stability. It's really all about the experience for the consumer. So you really want to cater to what consumers are looking for. And, you know, in some markets, people seek out certain strains, certain terpene profiles. So it's important to have an understanding of your market so you can put out the right products. Hand washing to save money or because it's the best way. When I first got into hash washing, th this is what I heard so many times that the only way to create a full melt product is to get your little paddle, get your trash can, and stir away for hours on end. And, you know, in the beginning, th this was the case. But now that we have more advanced hash washing systems on the market, things with uh, bottom down agitation, low shear impellers that are never actually coming into contact with the nugs themselves, they're simply using the water, the shape of the vessel to gently agitate this material. You can certainly make full melt with automated systems. That's going to help you increase that batch size and decrease your labor cost. So automating on the wash side is it, it's basically a must at this point in the game because there are so many companies out there with multiple automated systems that it, it's hard to compete with their price points and their margins. If you've got 10 people in a walk in cooler stirring trash cans for eight hours a day. Not washing in a cold environment. Uh, 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit um, is ideal. The lower, the better. You know, it's just difficult to find employees that are willing to stick around uh, in 30 degree walk-in freezers, uh, but it can certainly help with your entire process. So it's not just keeping your water and flour cold. It's about collection. So the colder your environment is, the faster that water is going to drain through those collection bags. Uh, because your your hash is not greasing up in those bags. Once you scoop it onto the freeze dryer trays, you dry that product. Being in a cold environment is great for seeding it uh, to break it all up into a granular sand-like consistency. And then even loading your rosin bags before you take them to your rosin press can really help with handling and not losing a lot to your jar that the hash is stored in. Not keeping your lab and tools clean you know, this is a critical step. I would say half of your time as a hash maker, as a rosin maker, it's going to be cleaning and sanitizing all of your tools. So that's everything from your ball valves, your processing tools, your system, your bags. They make a lot of different cleaning products out there that are for sanitizing. Uh, ISO is most commonly used, uh, but there's also ultrasonic cleaners out there that can help you really get caked up jars, uh, other tools like that. Uh, another thing to avoid here is not having enough freezer space to store your fresh frozen between batches. I think, you know, a lot of customers, they start off thinking that they want to just test the waters. So they build the smallest scale lab possible to minimize that capex. But, you know, not planning for the future and thinking about where you want to take this business can really create a major major bottleneck or even prevent you from taking on large harvests if you're going to be doing toll processing. So freezer space is one of the most critical components to being able to receive large amounts of flour and keep it at proper temperatures as you're waiting to process it. Not doing enough lab member training. You know, your team is everything. They're going to make or break your business. Uh, you see a lot of a lot of companies out there not focusing on lab member training. 
And then you have a lot of loss, whether that's handling the product, popping, losing it, not pressing for that extra 30 seconds to get the last bit of your yield, maybe not doing a second press, maybe not doing an extra wash on your hash washing side of things and leaving money on the table. So training is critical. I would really recommend finding a hash maker, especially one with experience on the recreational or medical market who knows the proper procedures to running an effective lab. Not test washing before purchasing bulk flour or taking your entire harvest and throwing it in the freezer with the hopes of processing it all into bubble hash. Uh, you know, what you want to do is take a very small portion, get a jar. There, there's a company that just released a product, Tiny Hash Co. we've been working with that allows you to do test washes in a small mason jar. So you're not dedicating a, a 20,000 gram batch of flour only to find out that it's not gonna produce well. So doing this in smaller quantities can really minimize your risk. Not putting in, out enough SKUs. There have been several studies out there from people like BDSA Analytics, a lot of these other companies that show, you know, there's an increase in profitability as a company by offering multiple SKUs. If you go into a new market and you're trying to focus on dabbable concentrates exclusively, especially a high quality one that carries a higher price point like rosin, it's gonna be really tough for you to be successful. So by offering all of these different SKUs, edibles, salves, tinctures, vape cartridges, you're casting a much wider net and, and you're a lot more likely to be successful in the end by having all of these different SKUs available. Advice on how to run a high margin solventless lab. So, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, you really want to focus on building a brand. Once federal legalization hits, you won't want to compete on price point with low price point products, low margin products. Once the cores, the Budweiser step into this, um, you're going to see the commoditization of a lot of different products. So if you focus on building a premium brand that has premium products, you have a look and feel, a large social media presence, more than likely you're going to be one of the ones to stand the test of time. You know, you look at the, the beer industry and a lot of these microbreweries are, are thriving simply because they're focusing on a quality product and focusing on a segment of the market that isn't touched by these people that are focusing on, on bulk product sales. You wanna plan your space and process with an actual hash maker. So these things that I mentioned earlier, like planning for expansion in the future, making sure you have the right environment, the right climate control to withstand the heat that a lot of this uh, equipment's gonna put out. You wanna make sure you've got the right you know, electric um, requirements met because a lot of these components like freeze dryers, they consume a considerable amount of power. Like some of these things like the Osprey, the press, they do have a very low power draw, but there are gonna be those components that are gonna require special outlets, special power requirements. So keep that in mind. You wanna build out your facility with expansion in mind. Um, vertical integration will give you the most control over the entire process which can typically lead to better results with the right team in place. When you're able to select the genetics, select the growing medium, harvest it the way you want, package it the way you want, not have to worry about transportation and freezer trucks, anything like that. Um, you've just got so much more control to do it the way you want to. Now, there are exceptions to this rule, of course. If you're in mature markets like California, Colorado, Oregon, Washington. There are so many growers out there at such a massive scale that you can get flour for pennies on the dollar and you really can have a profitable business toll processing. I've even seen, you know, companies in Michigan like North Coast that have been highly successful processing other people's material and either white labeling that or labeling it under their own brand if it meets their quality requirements. Uh, tissue culture 
is huge for special cuts that you find. You know, by taking these genetics and storing them, you're able to have them for years to come. They're clean. It can help you avoid pathogens, viruses that you'll find in your plants. There's really nothing worse than having, you know, that special cut that you decide to get rid of because maybe people got, you know, burnout on that particular cultivar. And then two or year, two or three years later, you know, you're sitting around thinking, I really wish I could get that cut of skills back that I had all those years ago. Um, so tissue culturing really allows you to store these genetics for an extended period of time. And finally, continuing R&D at every stage of the process, every stage of the business. So playing around with different cultivars, playing around with different harvest times, with different washing methods. You know, we've seen a lot of people start to experiment with washing with no ice. You know, ice isn't a required part of this process. And what we've seen by these customers doing this R&D is that they figured out that they're able to put out higher quality products. They're able to fit more material into their machine. Um, and even with the, the skews and consistencies on the rosin press, so pressing at certain temperatures, curing for different periods of time under different temperatures have really yielded a lot of these different skews that you'll see on the market um, that have popped up within the last year or two. You know, uh, a year or two ago, many people hadn't heard of Piatella. And now it's it's all that people talk about on the bubble hash side of things. So R&D can really help you push the boundaries of solventless and will help you continue to grow and reach a larger segment of the market. So now that we've finished the, the presentation here, we'll take some time for some Q&A, really go through and answer any questions that you might have. So if you have any questions, drop those in the Q&A box and I will address those one by one. Thanks, Cliff. Uh, appreciate, appreciate the presentation there. And yes, please um, type in any questions you may have for Cliff in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have a few re already, so we'll get right to it. Um, first question here is from Alan. Um, will you please expand on the benefits or disadvantages of cold versus hot press? Cold versus hot press. Okay, so... You know, a cold press, I would typically call anywhere from 160 to 175 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, a lot of people will press at lower temperatures because they think it's going to help retain more terpenes, better color. But what I've noticed is that as long as I'm sticking in that 180 degree Fahrenheit range, I really don't see a decrease in terpenes, the color of my product. Uh, now, once you start going into that 200 degrees, you will st start to see some loss in terpenes. Um, I guess the advantage to pressing at a hot temperature is that it spends less time on the plates. So you're able to get that rosin flowing a lot more quickly. Um, and then I, I listed the advantage for a colder press. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is from Bob. So Bob's asking, you know, what is the typical yield from one kilogram of flour to wet bubble hash. Um, so yeah, one kilogram, I think that's roughly 2.2 .2 pounds of flour to wet bubble hash. Yep, so typically, you know, as we showed in the, the yield range slide, you're gonna see anywhere from three to 7% if we're talking about fresh frozen. Now this doesn't really distinguish between fresh frozen or dry flour. Um, dry flour, as I mentioned, um, is going to be a fraction of the weight of fresh frozen. So if you're getting a 3 to 7% yield from fresh frozen to bubble hash, you're going to see four to five times that on your dry side of things. And, and just to clarify, this is the dry weight of the hash. I know you mentioned to wet bubble hash. Um, it's hard to determine what the wet bubble hash yield is going to be because people will knock out, you know, varying levels of moisture in their bags with their spoon as they're collecting. What you're really looking for is a wet milkshake-like consistency before you're scooping that onto your trays. 
Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And you were mentioning during your presentation too, that it's important to focus on, on terps, terpenes, color and texture as well. Um, you know, if people focus on that, is that going to just naturally fold into profits that we know that so many operators are, you know, focused on? Yeah. So you're going to have higher profits with, with higher yielding, um, higher yielding strains. You just might not have the sell through that you're looking for of those products uh, if they don't have the terps and the quality. Now, I'm not saying that high yielding genetics are not going to have those qualities. There are some winners out there that are yielding 6%, smell great, look great, taste great. I'm more just saying, you know, as a business owner, if that's all you're focused on is yields, you're missing the point and you're not seeing it from the consumer's perspective. Gotcha. Thanks. So um, Aaron is asking, you talked about, you know, yield for profit. Um, what number are you using to determine the profit? Are you talking about a cultivator selling wholesale or a cultivar being able to sell at retail margins? So I'm talking about the profit margins for the processor themselves. So after they either grow or purchase the flower, once labor, consumables, all of those things are calculated in and re reduced, um, that's the profit that I'm talking about for the solventless processor themselves. This doesn't affect you know, the growers that are selling directly to these, these processors. Jeremy's asking um, more of a clarification statement here. So you don't necessarily have to fresh freeze to solventless wash, correct? As long as the product is quickly pressed. So you want to freeze your flour, regardless if you're using fresh or dried and cured. Um, you don't have to freeze your material at all, but it's not going to yield great results. You're going to get a ton of chlorophyll leaching out. Uh, fresh frozen is always going to produce the highest quality because it's not spending that time at room temperature, wh whatever your dry and cure room is set to temperature wise, you are capturing all of the essence of the plant and locking it in by freezing it right away. So to answer your question, you don't have to, but you absolutely want to freeze every bit of material that you wash. Right. Just a, a quick reminder here before we ask the next question, um, a cop. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to all the registrants. So if you're curious about re-watching this webinar, we'll have a recording emailed out to you in three to five business days here. Um, this is this next question is from Matt. Can you touch on how critical it is to keep your lab cold and tips for those who might not have HVAC infrastructure to keep the room lower than 65 degrees Fahrenheit? For context, we will be using a glyco jacketed automation system and have plenty of walk in freezer space, but it's very expensive to be able to maintain 55 degrees in the lab itself. Yeah, absolutely. So if you can see right up here in the top left hand corner, uh, this is a mini split AC. They make add ons for those that are called cool bots that can help basically lower the temperature that that's able to achieve. Um, I know you mentioned you've got a glycol jacketed vessel that that's really not going to help you with what I'm talking about specifically, because if you have a well insulated vessel like this one back here, it's really not the, the water mixture that you're worried about. It's all of the processes surrounding the washing itself. So it's the collecting, it's the sieving after it comes out of the freeze dryer, it's the loading your bags. So as long as your wash system and a table is in a cold environment, it doesn't matter if the freeze dryer, the rosin press, your packaging table, although it can really help with packaging as well, uh, it doesn't matter if those are at room temperature. So hopefully that, that answers your questions there. Next question is from Brad. Um, once you process your fresh frozen, can you dry it out and put it through a system like a, an ethanol extraction system to get more yield out of the material? Absolutely. You can certainly do this. Um, you'll really want to test this before you go buying a bunch of ethanol and a system to do it because, you know, if you're efficient enough with your process 
and you're getting the maximum yields by taking it for that extra wash or increasing the RPMs on your wash, likely there won't be enough uh, material left to make it worth the consumable cost of the ethanol, the labor costs, the equipment needed to purchase that. So you can absolutely do it. It may or may not make sense for your business, depending on how much hash you're leaving behind in the system. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, this is from uh, Joshua. Do you recommend a low or high tonnage press for medium scale rosin pressing? Yeah. So, you know, I, I prefer presses that are around 20 tons, even though I'll never reach that 20 ton mark. When you want to do things like we mentioned earlier, somebody asked about pressing at low temperatures. When you want to press at 160 degrees, you simply can't do that with a, a five ton or an eight ton press, for example. Um, so, yeah, that that would be my preference is something that gives you the ability to go as high as you want but you don't necessarily need to go that high. This next one is from Chris. How do you feel that recycling the water affects the yield and efficiency of extraction? So personally, I have seen no effects to the yield or the efficiency of the extraction. Uh, we recycle the water simply because there's no reason to waste it. As long as we're keeping that mixture cold and a ton of chlorophyll isn't leaching out during the process, that water is perfectly fine to use for four to five washes on the same batch of material. So keeping it cold is, is really the only concern there. And, and once we start to see a ton of chlorophyll leach out, that's when you wanna dump it and, and start with a fresh batch of water. Um, Jonathan is asking, what are curing examples that are used to make different types of bubble hash yeah so there's there's temple balls um you know this is where people are using a hot water bottle uh, or a hot glass bottle that is rolling it over their their hash rolled out rolling it into a ball letting it cure um, there's things like piatel out there which is really popular here recently where you're basically cold curing your bubble hash by placing it into a fridge or a freezer, letting the terpene separate, whipping it, come back, let it sit at room temperature to grease up. Um, th there are a ton of different skews out there, but I would say Temple Balls and Piatella are probably the most popular skews for bubble hash. Uh, and then you start going into requiring decarboxylation to make things like edibles, tinctures, salves. Gotcha, okay. Uh, next question is, is anyone drying post-wash biomass and doing a hydrocarbon extract on it? Yep, th there are people doing that. Just as I mentioned earlier, it may or may not make sense for your business, depending on the cost of the hydrocarbon or solvent that you're using to try to capture that residual. This one's from Jeremy. How much should you trim the flour before washing? Should you just focus on removing the primary non-trichomes? Yeah, exactly. You wanna get rid of any big fan leaves. Um, you know, you wanna make sure that you pluck all those a week before harvest by hand. Um, any excessive trimming that you do to try to get it pretty like you would for flour is just gonna increase the amount of chlorophyll that leaches out in your wash. So rule of thumb, get rid of all the big fan leaves, any small sugar leaves, leave them, wash them. They're not gonna affect anything. This one's from Eric. Um, as far as au augmenting rosin slash resin with terpenes, how does this play into creating a differentiated product? Is this desirable in the market right now? Yeah, so I'm guessing you're you're talking about maybe adding terpenes back to your your end product uh, with things like live resin. You know that that's fine, diamonds, sauce, things of that nature. But uh, with rosin exclusively, I I, I think consumers, they're not really educated on on whether or not terpenes have been added to it or not. I don't think it's something that they're seeking out currently. You really just want to express the plant in the truest form. Um, so my recommendation would be to find genetics that have the terpenes that are desirable instead of trying to buy some and add them 
You never know how those were extracted. Some of them can be extracted using steam. Um, but yeah, I think most consumers on the rosin side, they're, they're not the same consumers as people looking for diamonds and sauce on the live resin side of things. This one's from Adam. Has anyone had good results with using solventless for infused THC beverages? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, as far as the the rec market, the med market, I can't say that I've seen um, many on the market. I, I don't know the reason for that, but I can tell you on the trap side, I've seen a lot of incredible, incredible beverages. There are companies out there, um, you know, on the rec and med side, like dialed in that I mentioned earlier, where they're making a lot of simple syrups where you can add it to any drink you want. Um, so I've been playing around with making, you know, cocktails with that, made an orange cream sickle drink the other day at my house, but it's basically a simple syrup that you then turn into another beverage yourself. So if you find any, shoot me an email, let me know. I'd love to love to try one. Noted there. So what, what types of, uh, this is from Joshua, what types of cogs do you see in, in various U.S. states for rosin vapes? Oh, that one. I am not. What type of cogs do you see in various U.S. states for rosin vapes? Cost not sold, yeah. Yeah, not, not entirely sure on that one. If you want to send me an email at cliff at lowtemp-plates.com and expand on that question, I would, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to take a deeper dive. Yeah, if you want to, can you repeat that email just for everyone? Maybe some people. Yeah, missed definitely. It. So it's uh, cliff at lowtemp-plates.com. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, this one's from Diane. Is ice really necessary for the process as long as the water is kept at negative one degree Celsius? So, you know. My uh, American brain does not think in in terms of Celsius. So for me, the ideal temperature range I'm looking for um, is around 34 degrees Fahrenheit. If you are able to achieve that with something like, say, a chilled water skid um, that's running through a water chiller, ice is absolutely not necessary. And I actually prefer not using ice in the process when I have access to something like that. It, it you know, ice just creates more shear. You really have to focus on the type of ice that you're using. Sharp ice can cause more chlorophyll to leach out. Adding more ice allows you to fit less material into your vessel. Um, so I found that I'm able to get less contaminant on those later washes, wash for longer and harder without using ice. So that that would certainly be my recommendation. The reason I mentioned that in the, the process overview in the beginning is because that's what people are used to. And that's the easiest way to describe to it because everybody's seen bubble hash made before at this point. This might be a little bit of an extension onto that. So this is from DeMonte. Um, what is your personal favorite solventless method and what is your least favorite? Ooh, so man, I wish we could expand on this question because um, when you say solventless method, I'm, I'm curious, are you talking about like post-processing methods? Like which SKUs do I focus on or the actual skews themselves like sifting or washing or pressing um i guess i can i can try to attack those from from both angles you know as far as my favorite solventless method like you have to wash you have to freeze dry you have to press like that's what people are looking for on the market it's not to say you can't use trichome sifting to put out a quality product um, but with where the equipment the scale the cost of it is on the sifting side it's really hard to achieve the same quality and consistencies as you can with the ice water hash method. Um, as, fa as far as like solventless methods for post-process skews, um, cold cure batter is, is always my favorite. It's the easiest. It's typically the most desired dabbable concentrate because I'm literally just taking a jar of hash or a, a jar of rosin that is, sealing it up, letting the terpene separate naturally, then coming back and whipping it up. And it, it's so satisfying to see it it really morph from this clear type rosin that's really sticky and taffy and hard to deal with to this cold cure rosin that's just so easy to scoop and handle and has that wet, shiny, you know, appearance that that's really appealing. Right. Yeah, maybe he, um, 
Demonte clarified later that he's talking about both, and it seems like you could probably talk all day about that. So maybe the two, two of you can connect later on. Um, I think we got about 10 minutes left, and we got lots more questions. I, I don't know if we're going to get through all of them here, but um, here's an interesting one from Stephen in regards to state by state marketplaces. He said, Stephen says, I'm in the Oklahoma market. How long does it does a market usually take to mature into live rosin? That's a, that's a great question, Stephen. And Oklahoma uh, was one of the the states that that didn't really follow normal conventions. Like it absolutely blew my mind to see the mass adoption in Oklahoma. There are so many people out there, like Canada Divine, that are just absolutely putting out fire live rosin. It seems like they adopted it immediately out the gate in Oklahoma. Uh, but in other states, you know, it typically takes two, three years for people to really start knowing what it is, why they want to pay that higher price point for the dabable concentrate sides of things. But if you focus on those other SKUs that we mentioned earlier, vape cartridges, edibles, gummies specifically, you can really decrease that amount of adoption time that it takes so you can be more successful right out the gate. But shout out to Oklahoma. It, it was crazy to see the the scale and, and the number of people that got into the rosin game. I mean, two months into legalization. Yeah, Oklahoma definitely, like you said, did not follow the, the normal trajectory there with the uh, Wild uh, West, man. Yeah, for sure. So um, this one's from Diana is the question is, is gently processing better for potency than a more vigorous agitation? So gentle really isn't going to affect potency. It's going to more affect the yield. So the amount of bubble hash that you're producing and the quality. So ideally what you would do is start with a very gentle agitation to remove your quality heads, all of the most desirable compounds, and then slowly increasing to a very rough agitation at the end to make sure you've captured every last bit of resin from this product that you can then dedicate towards edibles, some of these other SKUs that don't require your A-grade material. Okay, next question here from Steve. Um, and forgive me if I mispronounced this. So can you talk a bit more about patella hash and what justifies the higher price point? Yeah, so... You know, the Piatella, it, it's just a consistency of hash. Um, typically, it's only the 90 to 120 micron range of hash. Full melt typically works better for this process. So, you know, not all strains are going to put out full melt. Even if you are very gentle, you handle it properly, there are only some strains that are really going to produce that full melt hash. And even a smaller segment of that full melt will create Piatella. But really what it is, it's just a cold cured bubble hash. And the reason it's so desirable is the same reason that cold cure rosin is more desirable. It's that shelf stability, it's the wetness, and it's the bag appeal of that product that really makes it desirable. Because if you look at it next to a jar of, of sand, like hash, you know, very granular, fresh out of the freezer, I mean, that, that loaf of Piatella is nine times out of 10, it's going to look a lot more appealing to most consumers. This one's coming from Brandon. Can you comment on the recent trend of making solventless edibles and any differences one might consider to produce rosin for that purpose? Quality, process, ways to manage costs? Yeah, great question, Brandon. Great question. Um, so the recent trend of making solventless edibles, I mean, I think once consumers got a taste of what a rosin edible was like, and they really felt those significant effects, um, that's when they started, you know, looking for more rosin edibles. And as far as any differences on how to produce it, um, yeah, you're in luck. I've, I've got a really good way to decrease your labor, your costs. Um, so what I do typically, let's say I'm just washing for bubble hash or rosin. I'm going to load this system up and I'm going to do three to four to five washes on that same batch of material for 15 to 20 minutes a piece, collect three to four to five times. It, it can be labor intensive, but if I'm 
doing this for the sole purpose of edibles, what I can do is I can load this machine all the way to the top and I can do one wash for 45 minutes to an hour, collect all of that hash at once with one collection and significantly decrease that labor and the amount of effort that it takes to produce that. So, you know, with edibles, things like color, texture, things of that nature, they, they don't matter. All that goes out the window because it's going to be added to a jar and thrown in an oven anyways. So it's basically all going to have the, the same in, end effect. Nice. About five minutes left. We're going to get through a few more questions here, but just please note that if we don't get to your question, um, we're going to do our best to connect all our audience members with Low Temp Industries following this uh, this webinar here. Um, this is from Justin. Do genetics have any influence on yield from bubble hash to oil off the press? I have seen some press data that shows variance in yield from bubble to oil. And I am curious if that is user error, such as parameters of the press cycle, or do the genetics still affect the yields through the press process? Yeah, so the genetics can absolutely affect your bubble hash to rosin yield because some genetics will have a very thick cuticle of the trichome head, uh, which in turn is going to produce less yield for you. You know, the thinner the cuticle is surrounding that trichome head, the better your yields are going to be. This one's from Patrick. Are there any, are there any new excuse me here, are there any new solventless technologies on the horizon that low temp is working on that open the door for all genetics instead of hash bread strains? It's a great question. You know, we're, we're always working on things in the, in the background that could help with, you know, non-hash specific genetics. Um, I would say you, you'd probably have to wait a couple of years before we release anything of that nature, but we're always looking for what's next, right? And how to utilize all types of materials. So we, we will start on that very soon. And I, I think I know what you're you're asking there. Uh, this one's from Kim. Um, what are what are some specs for vape cartridges that perform well for rosin cartridges? Is there any way to reduce lipid content in the rosin prior to cartridge formulation? What are some specifications for vape hardware that perform well for rosin cartridges? So we've had a lot of success with ABD's cartridges. Um, you can reach out to one of their reps or shoot us an email. I can connect you. Uh, we see those in the marketplace a lot. Um, is there any way to reduce lipid content in the rosin prior to formulation to avoid clogging of the cart? Um, so really taking this long enough in the oven is, is really what you're going to need to do to break down those fat lipids, waxes that make their way through. Um, so just nailing the amount of time that it's in the oven. Um, and I have even seen people who want to take it an extra step, add this to a centrifuge, uh, after the decarb to try to further refine that product. But most of the time you can take this out of the oven if you've done it properly and not have to worry about that. This one's from Dan. Can you expand on decarbing material for edibles or cartridges? Yeah, if you uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, Low Temp Industries, we've got full videos on how to make edibles and cartridges that'll do a lot better at explaining it than I can in the the two minutes we've got left. Right. Um, this one's from Garrett. Considering automation and cross training, what is the smallest headcount you've seen for a standalone solventless lab in the mature states? Yeah, no, that that is a great question, Garrett. Um, I would say probably two people is the smallest I've seen. If we're just talking about the lab space, you know, uh, there have been one man teams who are doing washing one day, freeze drying the next, pressing the next. Um, but really, ideally, two people is the smallest I would ever want my team to be if I'm trying to do this at scale. This one's from uh, Ryan. When freezing plant material, do you leave the bags they are in? Um, do you leave them open in the freezer, rolled up, or heat sealed? Yep. So typically, you want to freeze this material um, while it's open to air. And once it's frozen solid, then you can tie it off, you can seal it, just make sure you're not vacuum sealing it, 
uh, to avoid damaging those trichomes. So uh, once it's frozen solid, you can seal it up. Only reason we keep it open while we're freezing is to minimize the frost that will build up that looks like freezer burn surrounding your, your plants. Um, I think maybe this will be our last one. It's a short one from you. So this is from Sean. You mentioned a new product to determine yield. What was that product called? Yeah, it's the uh, the it's from a company called Tiny Hash Co. The name of the product is the Hashling. Uh, it's still not released yet, but I would imagine you'll be seeing stuff in you know a month, month and a half. Okay. okay well, hey Cliff, you were great. Presentation was awesome. Thanks for getting through so many questions here. Um, and just a reminder to our audience members, once again, we'll have a, um, a replay of the video, um, sent out via email, um, in the next three to five business days. And again, feel free to, uh, contact Cliff directly since he was so kind to give out his personal email on this webinar. Um, and thanks for joining us today and I appreciate your time, Cliff. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. Thanks everybody for attending. Have a good one.